I first want to thank you, um, Louis and Crete, for um, wel welcoming me and Peter here to participate in this workshop that we're, we're taking part in, the SMILE workshop, which is very, very interesting. And it's my great pleasure uh, today to introduce Peter Wilkinson, a friend and colleague now for a very long time. I first met Peter 50 years ago, and we started working together in 1974. 48 years ago, when we both arrived at Caltech pretty much at the same time. And um, after his postdoc, well, he did his PhD at the University of Manchester, post, first postdoc at Caltech, and then he got a Royal Society Weir Research Fellowship, which he took to Joggle Bank. And then he was on the Joggle Bank um, faculty for some time, going up the ladder, through reader to um, full professor. And um, he's been, he was a, a director of research and full professor of radio astronomy at the University of Manchester for many years. He's now emeritus professor there. Uh, during that time, he was also the associate director of the Joggle Bank Observatory for many years. And the associate director is the person who really does the work, you know, <laughs> in this case. So Peter led Joggle Bank Observatory for many years. And I think, I think it's fair to say that Peter um, actually managed brilliantly a critical development when it comes to management, where you move most of the staff from Donald Bank to that. I think it's fair to say that Peter played a critical role. That's not an easy thing to do. Uh, Peter has made many contributions to radio astronomy, critical contributions. His um, expertise spans a wide range, all the way from designing instruments um, um, and having them built, and also playing a critical role in the development of key software, up to, of course, analyzing the data and analyzing results and writing really important uh, scientific papers. Um, one of the things that Peter and I collaborated on early, and in which people have played a very important role is the development of imaging with the LBI. Not obvious to perhaps the younger members of the audience that it was not always taken as an accepted fact that you can make images with the LBI. For many years, this was challenged by the leaders of the role of, of, of the field. And um, the problem was that phases were not being used. And uh, Peter and I worked on a program to develop hybrid mapping where you use uh, you uh, you introduce the closure phase as well as the output and you make the first image and Peter was the first author on the key paper on 3C147 which made the first true astronomical sub arc second um, image with sub arc second resolution that is a true image where the phase is taken into account possibly and it didn't just provide the first key one arc sub one arc second resolution. It beat the one arc second resolution by a factor of 100, right? Up until then, there were no astronomical images. Real images that people thought, ah, oh, this is an image I can believe. Okay, there were models, but there were no images because no phase in that. Um, so that was, I worked with Peter and it was a lot of fun um, working on that together, but Peter then went on to take it to a whole new level by developing a much more sophisticated approach to Peter and Tim Cornwall, um, which is now the basis for the way we do all our applications with the, with the LDI. So um, I think that was all I was going to say, but just let me check my notes. I want to be sure I don't leave anything out. Stop here. Stop here, okay. <laughs> okay, anyway, it's really great to, um, to have Peter here and have his, all his wisdom in, and input to the small uh, collaboration workshop that we're at today. So, Thank you very much, Tony. That was far too kind, and a lot of what he said was very much 50 50 effort with, uh, with the gentleman who's just been talking. Um, so, thank you for inviting me to the University of Crete uh, to take part in this SMILE project, which links with something that Tony and I did um, 20 plus years ago. So, it's a, a wonderful next step for the next generation to look for these mini lenses that might be might have all sorts of interesting cosmological implications if we find them and will have interesting implications if we don't uh, and it's uh, it's great to be part of that as uh, somebody advising but not doing too much because <laughs> the experts and the leaders and the dynamic young people are all many years younger than us which is as it should be but we have a role to play 
in advice. Uh, Tony was mentioning there that I've done a lot of my work uh, at mini arc second resolution. So with huge radio telescopes, the biggest in the world, separated by intercontinental distances uh, to look for mini arc second imagery for various astronomical reasonings, one of which was milli lenses. But um, I don't think you should do the same thing all your astronomical career. Some people spend their whole lives repeating their PhD thesis. And that is quite a good tactic, actually, because you become an expert in something, but quite narrow. But that can be quite a good career tactic, I have to say. I have not followed that. I've done all sorts of things. Now, the latest thing which I want to tell you about today in my uh, retirement, uh, now acting like a postdoc, which is marvelous, getting rid of Europe, um, university bureaucracy and administration, is not the world's biggest radio telescope, separated by thousands of kilometers. They're tiny, tiny little telescopes separated by a meter, which we'll talk about. So there's science in, across the electromagnetic spectrum in all Fourier components and all resolutions. So there is some science somewhere. And this is in relatively low frequency radio waves at low resolution. You have to have something which is different. And in this particular case, it's we're looking for extreme precision and accuracy in results. So with that um, little prologue, let me uh, go forward. Just a little bit. No, no it doesn't matter. It, the, the only the bad thing is it cuts off the very top. Yeah, maybe you can see this tower the, the very end of the presentation. I don't know how to move that down. It, the, the, the sides don't matter, but the top does. No, just to drag the... Uh... No, 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 that is just. Also, drag the best bar. Yeah. But it's supposed to disappear at some point, no? I know, it's not in my. No, this is in the world. Thing. If we disappear, it will be the chat. Ah, thank you, thank you. Ah, thank oh. you. Wow. Thank you, sir. Let's come back. Uh, no, no, okay. it will go away. Okay. Thank you. Very good. Thank you very much. Sorry for those on you on Zoom. So I'll start the talk, um, and I'm, I'm basically just sketching in some simple ideas. You know, at lunchtime, you don't hear great any great details. You want to have a general impression, and hopefully, you'll take away a couple of things to remember. That's all we have to do. But I'm starting off with a, a simple driver for this project called Elbas Elband Oscar Survey which is um, that uh, low frequency ground-based radio maps are used to constrain the synchrotron component for subtracting away the foregrounds for CMB studies. So the very lowest resolution, this is Planck, Planck imagery, which went down to uh, 30 gigahertz. Uh, but to get, the, to, to get a better handle on the synchrotron component, they use low frequency maps. In fact, one map made by Haslam is, I think, the highest sighted ground-based radio, radio uh, telescope paper. Um, so they have a use, these maps. This, this, is, the, this is the black map, but the ground-based maps, as you'll see. Hold on. Now, maybe that's not working anymore. That should be. Again. Yeah, okay, never mind. Okay, good, 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 good. So, people make ground based maps. How do you make ground based maps? Well, you have these big radio telescopes, um, and you put a receiver on it and you, you wave them around the sky and measure the amount of power. Uh, and here are, the, here are all sky maps with some uh, particular uh, projection at two different frequencies. This is at 1.4 gigahertz, 2.3 gigahertz. Uh, they're made with big radio telescopes to get resolutions of, um, I don't know, half a degree, 30, 40 arc seconds, 30 arc, 40 arc minutes. Uh, and these are the maps that you use to subtract away the, the galactic foregrounds. The trouble is, 
that making maps with very high precision with big dishes is extraordinarily difficult with very high precision because the, the dish is a complicated structure. It has focus box legs and, and focus boxes and it has edges and so on. So diffraction and scattering always mean that you have um, artifacts in the images. Here are some, here's an image, these stripes here, you can't see them very well here, but stripes here. Uh, there are always stripes in these maps because you're trying to link together data taken over days, possibly months, uh, and these telescopes, these have been made with telescopes in different hemispheres, not even the same telescope. So to link it all together at high precision, at the well above, well near the noise level, is virtually impossible because the, the very best great astronomers in the world have made these maps, and it's a great challenge. Uh, it, here's another example here. Look at this map here. It looks to us as if trying to tie together parts of the northern sky, although this is a uh, an overall projection, um, old sky projection. Here it looks to us as if the base levels, the zero levels of the maps, it's suspiciously wrong. We may be, might not be true, but uh, so there are always offsets in the overall radiometric temperature calibration. It's possible that they may, in this, because of these subtractions aren't perfect. Here is the, the Planck CMB um, anisotropy spectrum. At the low frequencies, there are some funnies. It could be that this, the imperfections of the low frequency maps are playing a role in that. So the problem is, when you're using dishes to make maps, which is what radio astronomers, everybody thinks the radio astronomer does. Um, here's a little dish here. Um, this is a particular experiment uh, called GEM which was set out for many years to try and make very accurate um, total power, total power, total intensity maps of the sky. And they went to great efforts to make a telescope which is uh, very big. And they use the outer parts of the telescope to shield from the ground. And they put um, wire mesh screens around it and tried to make sure that any line of sight didn't hit the ground. Well, you can't do it. You can't do it. Here's a map here uh, made from that. It's a little bit faded, but they had a circular scanning technique. And you can see these circular striations um, over here, but certainly here in the map. And this was a group of people who, were, who again, very, very good, did their very, very best with a reflecting dish to make a map of the sky you could trust. But they didn't make it. So what's the way around? Well, if you want to do absolute calibration, not something relative to something else, well, it is relative to something else, it's a relative to a flat body. If you want to do absolute calibration, um, you have to not use a dish. If you want the absolute calibration is comparing the power you get in with respect to something linked to a black body, which is usually a resistor in some cold substance. It's, as we're just repeating, I say it's very difficult because of the side lobes, because of the scattering, because you try to look up there, but I like to call it your peripheral vision of the telescope. I can, I can see you over there. I can't see you in detail, but I know you're there. So that's true of radio telescopes as well. So somehow or other, we've got to do this. So I can only see what's in front. And the way to do that is using a horn. And of course, the triumphant example of that was Penzias and Wilson in the 1960s, who understood this system. It's rather funny looking. It is a horn, it's just on its side. Uh, you'll all know about this. Uh, this is one of the seminal moments in, in the history of astronomy, actually, not just radio astronomy. They were able to make absolute radiometric temperature measurements, the power from the sky, in other words, and nailed down. <clears throat> the fact that there must be something coming into their antenna that they couldn't model because they understood that system well enough that they knew it just couldn't be rubbish coming in. You know, everybody's heard about the story of the pigeon droppings in there. Um, mm -hmm. They thought it might be dielectric in, in here. Uh, so they were able to 
make that statement. Actually, that statement there, plus or minus one Kelvin, we now know it's 2.75 to some million Kelvin. That one Kelvin is actually being very, very cautious. It's probably about 0.7 was their result in the 1960s. As, uh, if you ever read the, um, if you ever read the uh, Nobel Prize lecture from actually um, Bob Wilson, it impresses you how amazingly well they observed and used the, used the advantages they were given by the Bell Telephone Laboratories, which is the best technical radio astronomy place in the world at the time. But they really did make fabulous use of the equipment that they had. And they thoroughly deserved getting the Nobel Prize because they weren't expecting to find that. And it's only because they knew the performance of this dish and their system and calibrated it beautifully they were able to make a discovery. So our first goal, I'm, I'm chatting rather, well, I'll get going faster. Our first goal then, simple goal, before we get on to the, uh, the more interesting part of the talk, is just to establish the absolute base level, absolute base level of this L-band map of the sky. Um, is there a difference here? Because um, these maps of the sky aren't only just used for micro background uh, subtractions, there are all sorts of galactic studies where you'd like to know, uh, like to get things better. So that would be our, our bread and butter, one might say, result. Just, just getting this, uh, getting the whole base level of this map, because um, we are looking at much lower resolution than this, getting the whole base level of this map on a firm basis. So to get to the more interesting part of the talk, which links in with that, um, I'm using now, um, the uh, uh, I'm adapting a slide from uh, uh, Kogut, who was part of this arcade team. I'll come on to arcade in a minute. Who are the team who are have first proposed and are still proposing hard that um, there is uh, uh, a consistent. It's there, there is they claim that the maps of the sky we have at the moment, albeit we'll come to the fact that some of them aren't very good or have imperfections. It's consistent with an isotropic background. These are the, this is the um, galactic emission uh, projected in a peculiar way to, to show out the colder parts. This is the galactic plane wrapped around here, and this is the northern and the southern hemispheres. But this is just the synchrotron emission of the sky um, projected in an interesting way to make it easy. But when you look around the sky, the colder parts of the sky, um, it's true, you tend to see something like 11 Kelvin, doesn't really matter the details, but the radiometric temperature, 11 Kelvin. Uh, and they say uh, it's consistent with an isotropic background. And it's that story that is still up in the air at the moment. It's still a, uh, a controversial issue. They may be right. They may be right. We hope they are, because if, if, it, if they are, then it's, uh, it's very, very interesting. But there are some challenges to, to get to make sure it's on a firm basis. So what is the known isotropic background all over the sky? So we sit, we're looking out through the galaxy. So one of the problems is the diffuse Milky Way emission, because we're looking out as through a glass darkly. We're looking out through this clouds of stuff, foregrounds. Can you take account of that correctly? Can you? particularly take about, there must be some basic um, level of uh, the micro, uh, the, the radio uh, synchrotron emission from the Milky Way in all directions, the monomer, monopole component. Can you get rid of that? Uh, but of course, fundamentally is the cosmic microwave background. And then as there is the integrated contribution of all radio sources. So they, the, 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 the challenge at the moment is to see whether there is a new component in the sky. So the, the people who have been started this ball running seriously, although it's like many things, it's, if you look at it, it's been bubbling away in the literature for 40 years, because people were making maps and, and thinking there may be um, galactic halos or, or um, isotropic components. But it was really this team, the arcade team, uh, that's, that's brought this into the modern era. So they flew a balloon. Here's the, um, 
here's the uh, payload down here. Um, and they, they launched a beautiful radio astronomy experiment uh, <clears throat> with receivers from three to 30 gigahertz. And they were, and it is a beautiful thing. They were, they were very, very careful to calibrate the system very, very well. Uh, just briefly, the payload was basically a box full of liquid helium, is what it amounts to. And their receivers and their calibration system were all, nearly all the time, just sitting in liquid helium, which boiled away, so it has a finite lifetime. But simply through liquid helium. Uh, to cut a long story short, they observed at six different frequencies. Uh, they had scaled horns, which means you have the same beam at every frequency. And it's a beautiful experiment. I won't leave it at any more than that. Nobody's criticizing this experiment. It's a thing of beauty. Um, unfortunately, one of the receivers failed, but here is the results as a function of frequency. Here is the temperature of the micro background, 2.7, whatever it is. Um, and for most of their results, it's consistent with that one receiver fails assay. Uh, but at three gigahertz, their lowest frequency, they saw an excess. Right. And that triggered in their minds that uh, there's something funny going on. Uh, pity that could come across there, it doesn't really matter. That says that their temperature against frequency, and this is again, I've, I've stolen, well, I've adapted one of these slides. Uh, <coughs> um, imitation is the best form of flattery, so it's, I'm, I'm copying what he's, what he's written. But here are the arcade results down here. But if you look at um, other maps you know, from the ground, which we, sh we showed some of the beginning, some of those ground-based maps, and if you look at the coldest bits of the sky, that's all just, um, you can, they claim, and they could be right, uh, that you see a steep spectrum of emission uh, when you look at the coldest parts of the sky with an spectral index very similar to that from the galaxy, as it turns out, and actually from radio sources. <coughs> Usually it's about 2.7 <coughs> temperature spectral index, the usual synchrotron spectral index 0.7. <coughs> and that's about one Kelvin at one gigahertz. They got 55 milli, 55 milli Kelvin at, uh, <coughs> at um, uh, three gigahertz. But, but, and this is the big but, as I've been saying at the beginning, these older surveys all have calibration errors, sometimes as big as five to 20 percent, particularly as you, it gets worse as you go to lower frequencies, it gets harder and harder. And they have zero level errors. Is zero on your map zero? Is it, or is it seven more Kelvin or tens of Kelvin as you go down to lower frequencies? And the other problem is that the, here is a gray as the sky, the whole sky in some projection. <coughs> here's the North Polar Spur, here's the galactic plane in gray. Their map, because it's on a, on a balloon, thank you. Thank you, on a balloon, and it just scans around for, I can't remember how long it was up for, maybe two weeks typically. Um, only covers 7% of the sky. So you have to, in analyzing their data, you have to assume a model of the galaxy, this gray stuff, to subtract away from their data to see whether their 55 millikelvin at three gigahertz is real or not. What they did is assume a very simple slab model, which means you have a, um, a coset distribution of brightness, basically a simple model of the galaxy, the simplest possible model of the galaxy. <coughs> now, we know that can't be correct in detail, <coughs> since there's an awful lot of all this stuff around here. Look, that's not symmetric. And you have that would be averaged out in any slab model. And indeed, a critical thing is the coldest spot in the radio sky, if you had a very simple symmetric model, should be at the galactic pole. And it isn't, it's quite a long way away. <coughs> Alternative models have been uh, put forward to explain this, um, these, uh, whether they could be um, a diffuse 
synchrotron component, isotropic component, <laughs> which is to say that the galaxy, and here's the galactic disk, here's we are looking at, here's we're looking in different directions. <coughs> um, you can put together many things. If you have, give, give yourself enough parameters, you can fit an element. Mm -hmm. So you can, uh, you can come up with a model uh, which doesn't have any extra galactic, very distant uh, emission, and say it's all due to a halo around our galaxy. People have been talking about that again for 40 or 50 years. The trouble is, it's very hard to see it, ra such radio halos around other nearby galaxies. If you look at the VLA and deep images, you don't see this stuff. So it could be our own galaxy is unusual. Could be, probably not. What about extra galactic radio sources? Again, I've stolen um, something from uh, Al Kogut's uh, talk here. I've uh, adapted it a little bit. But here are the source counts <coughs> as a function of uh, Jansky's uh, source counts, normalized source counts here. We all know the source counts actually falling away now down here as you get better and better and better. Currently, if you integrate up all these sources um, at 1.4 gigahertz, um, they don't make much of a contribution, 20% of any possible excess. Um, if you were going to create the whole of this um, um, supposed isotropic uh, background with sources below the current sensitivity levels, well below, this is hopefully SKA territory in uh, 10 years time. Um, <clears throat> there could be populations of very faint radius source. We need to have an awful lot of them. And they would be exceed the density of galaxies in a Hubble deep field by a factor of 100. Not impossible. Not impossible. But the trouble is, if you had population of this density uh, with any like standard properties, so you, you start in violating the current infrared and um, high energy radio back, high energy backgrounds. So this is possible, but. Again, there are strong constraints on what these such objects can be. So, where have we got to? The current situation is, are we seeing, is it just bad data? Is it just a combination of offset errors in the radio map and there's no new background at all? I think probably not, but certainly that's the reason why we're doing our experiments. But, uh, it could be. There are lots of offset errors in the maps, which get worse at low frequencies. And of course, when you plot things on the log scale, you smooth out a lot of funnies. Could it be the fact we just don't understand the galactic emission well enough? And is there a galactic halo? Possibly. You need better data. Could there be a population of as yet undetected radio sources? Just recently, I was at a talk at John Robert in Manchester on Monday about somebody who was talking about um, uh, accretion onto a population of primordial 10 to 6 solar mass black holes, which uh, might be a relevance to smile. So people at the moment are, are theorists are bubbling over with ideas as to what this not necessarily real background is. There are other uh, exotic explanations. A paper from Manchester, uh, uh, a paper I read in Manchester just uh, a few, again a few days ago, said so they, why can't there be all sorts of exciting uh, dark matter annihilation and dark, dark photons turning into real photons? So give theorists a, uh, a possibility and they'll invent all sorts of possibilities, all sorts of explanations. But the interesting thing here is that uh, they, this, this particular paper said the spectrum doesn't actually have to be straight, it could be curved. So, a long story short, there's no consensus on the reality of this background at the moment. I think it's a distinct, is it between probability and possibility? It's certainly a strong possibility. I suspect, it, I suspect it might be there, but we haven't really nailed down its properties. But the possibility is tantalizing. And one of the most interesting possibilities, um, uh, again, generated vast numbers of papers, is this uh, edges result, which is, a uh, very low frequency measurement of the spectrum of the sky, of the, of the whole sky at 78 megahertz, which is redshift 17, hydrogen of redshift 17. 
and they claim to have detected an absorption line, deep absorption line, rather broad. There's a lot of controversy about this result. Uh, an Indian experiment has failed to confirm it. Other people are making measurements to, uh, to test it. Again, a very, very tricky measurement to make. To explain this, there would have to be an additional source of radiation energy at very high redshifts. Um, I won't go into the details. I'm not sure if I understand the details, but it's certainly true. So there's, that's why people got very excited about this possibility of an isotropic radio background, because that could, could uh, impact upon this, uh, this potential result still unconfirmed about uh, an absorption of hydrogen in the, uh, in the very early universe. All right, that's a long story. Well, it's not a long story. It's just it's an exciting area at the moment. So there was a meeting on this, or there were two meetings actually, but the, the one which has uh, really discussed it in detail, it said it would be fruitful to make measurements over the range 20 to 3 gigahertz with well calibrated zero points and gains over large patches of the sky. So this is what we're trying to do at 1.4 gigahertz. So we decided we wanted to make a contribution, particularly Ian Brown. Uh, here, here's me, and here's the team. Uh, so it's a very small team. Um, really, the people doing it are this, 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 these are the people, three people doing it. Here's a PhD student. This guy is um, a guy called Chris Radcliffe, and he was a, Ian and Brown and myself came to Job World Bank as PhD students together in 1967. Uh, and Chris here was a PhD student with us at the same time, but he got fed up and left early and uh, ended up making it, creating his own company who make uh, specialized RF equipment. And he's, uh, he's done quite a lot of the detailed RF design for us. We, we were capable of doing so That's been great fun. He's enjoyed, uh, he's enjoyed in his semi-retirement uh, doing some of the modeling. Uh, Duncan has built most of the receiver and all the technical, other technical parts. So our goal is to make an absolutely map of the calibrated map of the whole sky with this sort of accuracy, which uh, you notice 10 times better than in Penzias and Wilson's discovery of the CMB. Quite challenging, but it is nearly 60 years later. But on the other hand, Penzias and Wilson did have the very best labs in the world at the time. And even the, the Bell Labs in the 1960s was, even by modern standards, was still a pretty brilliant place. So it started from just doing the northern sky from Jodrell Bank because it's much easier to make things work when you can drive into work every morning and not have to disappear off to a site thousands of miles away. The challenge is then in any such of these absolute measurements is to take account of the environment, trees, ground, the system itself, the atmosphere, You've got to get rid of RFI, and in the end, you've got to make an accurate radiometric comparison to a black body. So all of those are challenges. So we're going to work in the protected 1.4 gigahertz band. There's a, most of radio astronomy bands are very, very um, infiltrated by commercial uses. Uh, but the, the band for the hydrogen line around 1.4 gigahertz is still protected in most of the world. But if you look at uh, a world map of where it's being radiated at 1.4 gigahertz, it's in China and in Syria, where people are not behaving themselves. There are international, there are satellites going around the world observing in this band for, um, for uh, Earth resources, and they can tell you where all the radiation is coming from. It's rather interesting. It's <coughs> Italy is not too good. In Europe, Europe's really good. The United States is marvelous, um, but mostly it's China and uh, and Syria. So we're going to use horn antennas, uh, and what you have to do is understand your system incredibly well. Is what it amounts to, even better than than Penzias and Wilson. Um, so we have to we have to surround it with a ground screen. This I took this picture just before coming here. Ian Brown and I have made this back here. This whole thing. This is four meters tall, and this is going to be covered with uh, wire mesh. You can see a little bit of that. <clears throat> so we've nearly finished it. We built this weatherproof cover for the system. <clears throat> that is also about 2.5, two and a half meters tall there. So the receiver's inside there. Um, you, uh, you have to uh, monitor the atmosphere. 
to see whether you can observe through clouds. You can't observe through clouds. <coughs> if, you, if you were badly affected by clouds, then Joggle Bank would never happen You're in Radio Manchester. But uh, for many purposes, it's a, mod it's a sort of second order effect. You don't really worry about it too much. It could all come out in the self calibration. But uh, for this purpose, you can't observe through clouds. Clouds can affect you at the fractions of a Kelvin level easily. It would be a killer. So uh, we have a we have an um, infrared detection system uh, which tells you constantly measures uh, the difference between the infrared sky temperature up there <coughs> and the ground temperature. If you get clouds, clouds are only a kilometer up, so they're only six degrees cooler. Uh, colder than the ground. So if you look at the sky temperature and it's not much different than the ground temperature, then you know you've got clouds automatically and you can throw that data away. <clears throat> and the clear sky infrared temperature is very strongly correlated with the water vapor content. So you can make a subtle correction for water vapor, which is very small actually. <clears throat> the main point is when we're observing at night, uh, you can tell whether you've got clouds on it and throw away the data when they turn cloudy. And we're only going to observe in clear sky conditions at night and avoid the sun. <coughs> um, so what you do, what, what you have to do in all these experiments, you start off with a relative experiment. So the relative experiment is made, you have two horns and you measure one horn against the other. And I'll show you some pictures. Uh, and what is the, what is the relevant, the reference position is to point at the north celestial pole. So you point at Polaris in the Northern Hemisphere, and the sky rotates around there. And you can make that your reference signal. Uh, so the first experiment is to do everything with respect to the North Pole. Then in phase two, if you haven't done that, you have to establish the absolute temperature of the North Pole uh, with respect to a coaxial load, a, ref, a receiver, I mean, a, a, a resistor in a cryostat. That's going to be a challenge we have yet to do. But it's encouraging that Earth Resources satellite radiometers, some, some built by JPL, some built by uh, uh, ESA, do work at this level in L band today. They're looking down. There's a, something that looks like a small VLA looking down called ESMOS. And they measure the surface brightness of the sea and the land. And it tells you about water, it tells you about sea salinity and land um, and the amount of water in the land. So these have achieved this, so why can't we? Well, we will. So here's, uh, here's a rather fuzzy version of the telescope. Here's the two horns, we'll be talking about that. Just to show you where we are at Joggle Bank there, there's the back end of the Joggle Bank telescope. Um, so two horns match on a structure which can rotate a bit, not that we're going to rotate it very much. Uh, <clears throat> so here we are, here's, here's a horn pointing towards the North Celestial Pole, that's fixed in position. Then another horn will move and look at the sky, and your receiver is constantly comparing that horn with respect to that horn. And the receiver is in this box here. <clears throat> so the, the, the North Celestial Pole can act as a stable reference source this blue stuff is the sky. It rotates around the North Celestial Pole there, but you have a beautifully circular fixed telescope beam there, and you're observing circular polarization, so you don't have any worries about the fact that the sky is linearly polarized. So we're quite confident that just having a, a circular, beautifully circular beam with circular polarization <coughs> gives us a fixed reference point on the sky. Just quickly, just it gives you an idea of the, of the care you have to take to make these to make these measurements. Here's our horn, and it's a very simple. It was an ice cream cone. It was made in the lab. It's some very good people get some aluminium, cut it to the right shape, like you do a piece of paper, fold it round. The trick, because that's that's a very simple system. The trick is in this part here. I always think it's this throat, which has got a complicated structure in it. I always think it's like a music instrument, you know, you blow down a trumpet. Uh, and what's the difference between uh, different musical instruments? It's all to do with the harmonic content. They all have the same fundamental. You need to excite different harmonics. Well, you do that by having complicated um, throat constrictions down here. 
which is what Chris designed for us. Come to the polarizer in a minute. We have a polarizer system. I won't explain this to you, and it doesn't matter. But you, this is a, a, a very, very carefully designed polarizer, which means we only observe in circular polarization to very high precision. Um, if you don't know, but that's a very good number. 40 dB is a factor of 10 to the minus four. Um, so here we are, just to show that things are going ahead. Here's the, here's the team again. Uh, this is me. Uh, here are the two, two antennas. Uh, and we're just, uh, it was, while, while this guy, Chris, was visiting us, we're just um, doing some uh, initial tests. You need a huge amount of testing for this. I'll rather you sketch in some of the ideas. You need a huge amount of testing because you have to understand your system so well. Here we have our two horns and we, you can put them face to face and radiate, radiate from one and see what picked up in the other. And can you predict it? So this is one of the many, 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 many tests we've used to establish how the signal is transported through <coughs> this system. Uh, into the and into the final uh, detection system. Uh, we've measured the, the uh, classic thing in radio astronomy to measure the reception beam. You put it in a, in a screen and uh, rotate this around, radiate at it, <coughs> and measure the beam. Uh, it looks pretty much as predicted. Here's the predicted beam, this red stuff, um, which is very got low side lobes. The trouble is, um, when you radiate at something from the ground, the ground in front of the antenna scatters radiation. So it means you can't measure down here. But the beam looks pretty much as expected. So here we are saying scattered radiation limits how well you can do. But this is the, the, pri the primary beam is pretty good. And we suspect it will go down, maybe not down as far as this, but uh, we expect the side loads are very good. And of course, we're going to surround the whole thing in a screen. So uh, radiation, this is, look, this is 150 degrees away from where you're pointing. This is pointing forward. This is looking, this is having peripheral vision in the back of your head. This is like having eyes in the back of your head. <coughs> we're surrounding the, the dish with, um, <coughs> with this ground screen to cut out any, any possible um, uh, emission in wrong directions. Here's the beam looking at the sun, so just demonstrating the system is going. As you can see, the beam looks uh, really very nice. <coughs> very quickly, um, the receiver, you're not going to be told, you don't want to hear about the receiver in detail, but what's interesting, it's based on the knowledge we had at George Will Bank and, uh, uh, from the Planck receiver. The Planck receiver was a, a receiver with, whose architecture is exactly the same as this. What we've done, the Planck and W map is the same. We've taken the Planck 30 and 44 gigahertz receivers and scaled them up in wavelength or down in wavelength, up in wavelength to uh, 21 centimeters, 1.4 gigahertz. So they're big things. In Planck, everything is like this. <laughs> this is a receiver like this. But the fundamental principles are the same. Um, what's it do? Well, Again, what you're doing is you're comparing the results from the two different horns all the time. <clears throat> and uh, the system switches between the two horns. Um, and to cut a long story short, if everything is balanced in between the, between the, uh, in the middle of the receiver, all the gain variation of the amplifiers cancel out, because that's what you can't, you don't want the gains to vary. And this switching trickery uh, enables you to cancel out gains and losses after the amplifiers. This is a well-known technique. You just applied it at a longer wavelength. And this is what made Planck, LFI, and WMAP all adapted the same principles. So here's, uh, here's <laughs> what we decided to do. This is looking down on the receiver. This is what the PhD student built. He's just... Uh, finished his PhD and is looking to get his viva soon. <clears throat> In a radio receiver, you will probably not know, to go from the natural radiation from the sky to anything that turn, can turn a needle or um, be detected in some way or other, you need to get down to a sort of milliwatt of power. 
but coming in through the sky is typically 10 to the minus 14 watts. So you typically need gains of about 10 to the 10 in your system. <clears throat> Huge amount of gain, and you just take for granted all oh, it's in the system. We made a decision to have that all at the same frequency, which is normally said to be a no-no, all the gain at the same frequency, because you tend to be it's prone to oscillations and instabilities. Well, yes, we had to do an awful lot of faffing amount to get that working. And you need to control the temperature of all this whole business to fractions of a Kelvin to make sure it stays stable. So it's all in a box, in doubly insulated boxes, and we have a thermostatically controlled heater system. So this is our goal. This is why we have to, it's such an agony, but it's fun, it's exciting agony. Um, to measure to 0.1 Kelvin accuracy. Remember, 10 times better than 10 degrees of Wilson. Looks as though it should be easy, but it's not. <clears throat> it requires you knowing things to radio astronomers at the milli dB level, or basically that's equivalent to tiny fractions of a percent. You have to understand this. So you, that's why we have all the ultra careful consideration to how the signal propagates through the system. And the system will not only reduce your signal, but it also emits noise along the way. And uh, we'll come to that now. So a critical part of the system is to measure the temperature over the whole system. And one of the things the student did was to build a temperature monitoring system. Here are all the thermistors. Here's the control system. So all over the system, 38 separate places we're measuring the temperature to a fraction of a Kelvin. Inside the inner box where the receivers are, that's that receiver and temperature control. But, but particularly in the open air, this part is incredibly critical to know what the temperature is doing. And particularly the, the cable between the antenna and the receiver. And uh, you can see here's the box here, but because we have to do, we have to do this, we have to be able to move like this, and there's a fixed box. <clears throat> the weakness of our, our Achilles heel is this cable. We have two of them. Uh, and you have to know the performance of that cable very well. Uh, excuse this, but this is the essential part, the critical part of the whole system. The cable transmits power. And what can change that power and fool you? Well, the cable can bend as a Hall's moving innovation. Uh, and in particular, you may have to disconnect and connect. Can you, does it, do you have any variations with disconnect and connect? But particularly, the changes in the temperature distribution on the cable as the weather changes, because the cables are in the outside air. Um, what happens is, if the temperature of the cable changes, the amount of signal transmitting can change, but also, when you have, in any, any system, if you have loss, or reduced transmission, you also have noise emitted. So just as an example, these cables might have a loss of, we say, 0.7 dB, which means that only 85.1% of the signal coming into the hall is transmitted through the cable. And at the same time, the cable emits noise of 45.7 Kelvin. That's at a temperature of 290, well, 17 degrees centigrade. If that changes by Q Kelvin, this is going to change by easily um, 0.1s. So you have to understand the cable properties very well. So here's an example. We tested the bending. You can see, look at the we bend it every 15 minutes. You've got a piece of cable and bend it. What happens to the loss? Mind you, these are very precise measurements, but you can see when you flex the cable, you change its properties. So you have to be very, very careful. <clears throat> not to flex the cable on, on a short short radius, which we have done. You have to measure it. How does the temperature, the properties of the cable change as a function of temperature? It's no, it's no good just measuring the, the loss in the cable at one, one temperature. What happens when it goes down to uh, below freezing? Then up in the, in, uh, in the summer, the nighttime temperature might be, even in Manchester, 20 degrees centigrade. What happens? So you have to, as, so what we're building is we have to build an, a whole input output model of the entire receiver and uh, model, for example, a coaxial cable with all sorts of temperature zones we've measured on it and losses and uh, how the loss changes with temperature, et cetera, et cetera. It's not very complicated, it's a bit messy. 
Um, we're nearly finished now. Um, what's interesting about this receiver is the system is systematic error dominated. Nearly always in radio astronomy, we'll be talking about today, <clears throat> what's the sensitivity, what's the noise level? This experiment is absolutely nothing to do with that, all to do with systematic errors, what students don't learn about in, in, uh, in data analysis courses, biases in the data, errors in your, in your readings and so forth or another. It's, a, it's, a, it's not the usual thermal noise limited. Our system temperature is quite high. We're not, it's all uh, cheap. It's all room temperature. We don't have helium cooling. Um, the thermal noise in a minute is under five millikelvin, and that's compared to our 0.1 Kelvin target. And we could be integrating for a lot longer than a minute. So this whole business is calibration, calibration, calibration. Right, nearly finished. So recapitulation at the end. We're looking for this isotropic background. There is no consensus yet on its reality. Well, certainly not in the details. I think it's probably there, but fundamentally the facts are not well enough established at the moment. We need to get better facts. Um, if a new isotropic background can be confirmed, it would be a new cosmological probe. Totally unexpected. There are all sorts of people writing papers about what it might be. Uh, various dark matter set of physics has been proposed. Um, it's possibly an early population of radio sources with unusual properties. Uh, the SKA can test that. So Ian Brown and I wanted to make a contribution to this understanding. It's a current messy state. That's why we built LBAS. Last slide now then. Our status then, the hardware and software is in place and working. We've still, one little last bit is to, to in, implement a continuous gain monitoring system, <clears throat> but we've got the hardware for that. We know exactly what to do. That'll take us another couple of months. And then the task, as, as was with Penzias and Wilson, who I think are my heroes in this, because they took several years and I have got their final result. They spent 18 months worrying about whether whether they could be making a silly mistake before they finally decided no, they couldn't be. Um, the task is calibration, 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 test, cross-check, and chasing down sense source of small power variations. It's fantastic student, for student and for old students like me. Uh, our initial phase one observations are going to be drift scans of northern sky starting in the next few months. And we have a proposal under consideration um, with some significant hope of success to move the entire system to uh, Tenerife in a couple of years' time, when we've done everything we can in Manchester, for extending the sky coverage down well into the southern sky. And I will stop there, and uh, I'll be glad to answer any questions if you have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. Very stimulating and very exciting talk. Thank you. Sorry if I went on a bit long. Yes. Okay. Uh, I just have a quick question regarding the galactic uh, program that uh, you mentioned. Uh, how hard it is to get to remove? Uh, what is happening with the uh, so-called Fermi bubbles, like the diffuse bubbles that we've seen in Fermi data that we see now in X-ray and so on? Is there any indication that those appear in radio and they may contribute to this problem? I don't think it's very, they're very obvious in the radio. I must say, you see these, uh, these maps. So that's an interesting question. And I have to say the best answer is to say, I don't know. I don't know. That's an interesting little thought to trigger in our mind. Mm -hmm. we, have a, we, have, we do have some experts on the galactic uh, radiation. It's not me. That's uh, um, Dr. Leahy, who is in fact the PI of the project. He's the PI of the project because he is the only working academic. So when you're trying to run a grant, you need somebody who has a direct link into the, into the faculty. But he is, a, he is working on an experiment, has worked on an experiment, Tony totally knows well, called CBAS, uh, which is uh, polarization of the galaxy. So uh, if he was here, he would give you a better answer than me. And my answer is, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Thank you. But it's a good question. Thank you. Stunning. I do actually have a question about the galactic halos. Why? Uh, so
So you say it's not seen in external galaxies, right? But there is a, if I remember correctly, there is a, 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 a paper by Joe Bregman, who actually stacks um, Planck's data of galaxies, certain galaxies, and does find, he found, he finds uh, synchrotron emission uh, at the level of three sigma, I think. Um, which well, is expected. I mean, galaxies should have a head. Oh, indeed, indeed, indeed. It's, it's a significant halo. Uh, so this is a, you know, the, when you look with the VLA at Elban, and I would love to be the halo, look at the VLA at Elban, and there is a whole group of people who's doing nothing but trying to look at, trying to find these things in nearby galaxies called Changes. It's a, it's a um, uh, um, name. Uh, and you don't see them at this Kelvin level at one gigahertz. So it, it would mean our galaxy would be unusual. But people have been ag agonizing about uh, talking about galactic halos for, for many, ah, uh, Milky Way halos for many years. So who knows, but it's not obvious that uh, otherwise it would be an obvious interpretation that you don't see them in other galaxies. Currently, anyway, with current sensitivities. So, when are you going to have an answer? <laughs> you say you start in a few months. When do you expect to have your? Well, it's on uh, the time scale. It's on the time scale. We have one PhD, actually. It's on the time scale of a couple of years, I think. I'm not talking about the whole sky. I'm just talking Northern about sky, yes. Yeah. Northern sky. A couple of years. We, we have to do a couple of years because we want, in a couple of years, we want to move it to Tenerife. <laughs> So the, 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 the good thing is the resolution is very low. <clears throat> so there aren't many pixels in the northern sky. So uh, covering the sky is, is quite quick, although you have to observe at night. So it takes, it takes you over the course of the year if you're observing only at night. Uh, but um, the trick is once, you, once we've got the, the, um, the systematics down to the level we want to do, then it's, it's relatively quick. Because we don't have many pixels across the sky with this relatively low resolution. So it's only weather <coughs> dependent, right? Because you yeah. want to observe only a green sphere. Yeah, but even in Manchester, you probably, it's probably 10 to 15 percent. 15 percent, I was saying, of nights would be suitable, perfectly suitable, right. which is okay. It's okay. It's a gentleman's space or a lady's space, mm -hmm. so this experiment. So when you say that people are trying to make such a background dark sector effects, what exactly are they having in mind? Do they produce charged particles with dark matter? I could. I'd be very happy to. Uh, I'd be very happy to send you this latest paper, which is uh, by somebody in Manchester actually, but it's but it, and somewhere else, which explains exactly what they were trying to do. It's a complicated. It's a complicated, this begats this, and each turns into this. Sure, but is it a cosmological signal? Or oh, yeah. Does come from the galaxy? No, 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 no. It's a deep cosmological signal because they're these, they're, well, they're these theories. People are most excited by is it anything to do with this edges result at redshift 17? Um, so it's the, the it's early universe theorists who are particularly interested in this whole business. That's why we're. It would be great if real. We would like it. We're not trying to disprove the arcade results. It's just that we we are we were in the end we will probably what be one of several groups to help to nail it down. I'm not sure claim we will completely nail it down, but we will make a serious contribution to uh, to understanding the next step of understanding. But I'm happy to send you this. Uh, I'd be happy to send you this paper. Okay. Uh, so, <clears throat> can you do such an experiment in space? Like you, you said, uh, you, the the circuit needs to be have the balloon, right? Yeah. So yeah, well, the, the CMB experiments are done in space, of course. So yeah, course. but you are going to lower frequencies. Right? Yeah, yes, so yes, you maybe course. need yes, of bigger course. instruments. Of course, of course, but in space, if you can do it on the ground. You will never get funding. Well, not yeah. quite true. Not quite true. But I'd like to get funding to do it in space. 
Because everything in space costs at least one and a half, if not two orders of magnitude more. No, the, the, I, I understand it, but I mean, if you need such high resolution, and I mean, as you say, yes, of course, of course you could, of course you could. You could make it all much lighter than this as well. You'd have to do. Um, yes, of course you could, and you may in space you may decide you don't need two horns. Mm -hmm. uh, you just need one horn in a radiometric system, which is now well known. It's been done. Flown on the, on Planck, which worked beautifully. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so yes, you could. Okay. Yes, you could. But getting funding for it will be difficult. <laughs> oh, okay. You know, the far side of the moon will be marvelous. <laughs> the far side of the moon will be marvelous, and maybe in your lifetime. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that more expensive than going on? What far side of the moon? We'll see. But if it's the right experiment, <laughs> well, in orbit, you have to shield yourself more than living radiation, not only from the sun, but from the earth. So, you sure, but uh, I mean, putting something like, like that in the ISS, wouldn't that work? No, it's got like horrible ground. You're only 200, 300 kilometers up, so you've got all this horrible ground radiating up at you. Yeah, but so you don't escape from the ground. Yeah, but you can always be looking at it. Yeah. You need a huge ground screen. So. Well, the moon is a very good ground screen if you're on the far side. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. I was going to say, it's another, this is a very good way of keeping old men fit. Because okay. building this ground screen, this four meter ground screen, has been uh, <laughs> quite challenging, but good fun. Good fun. <laughs> okay, well, let's thank Peter once again. <laughs>